I could throw myself in the ground in their stead, I'd do it. Gladly. What really went down back there on that boat? We missed you. That's what happened. Dutch killed a girl in a bad way. But it was a bad situation. I think I... I mean, we... gonna be okay. You ain't much of anything more than a killer, Mr. Vandalin. This ain't about revenge, Jose. Angelo Bronte don't mean shit to me. I just need somebody to buy me some goddamn time. You keep killing folk, does you? Right, sir. Do you have my bed? Dutch Vanderlyn, charismatic leader, loving father, idealist. Dutch is not a villain. Dutch is not an antagonist either, exactly. There's never any moments within the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 that finds him entirely at odds against Arthur or even John. He does leave them both on separate occasions to the fate of being captured or even potentially killed, yet he's never found at the barrel end of Arthur's gun or begging for his life at the mercy of a vengeful John in the epilogue. Dutch may be labeled as crazy and continues to be increasingly labeled mentally unstable and irrational as the story of the Vanderlyn gang goes on, but that doesn't make him the enemy. He is only a threat to everyone's ultimate safety when it comes to the benefit of his own personal gain and salvation. Dutch is not a good guy driven by the need and assurance that the rest of the members under his watch will be taken care of. It's quite possible that was never even a genuine concern of his. I personally don't ever believe he really strove to provide food, warmth, safety, and what is possibly the most important thing in his eyes, a free way of living to those he took in. Dutch is many things, and I think many of us can interpret his actions in different ways. But at the end of the day, he's not the villain of Red Dead Redemption 2, nor is he the hero. Dutch Vanderlyn is nothing more than a master manipulator, a silver-tongued fox who cultivated a following in his own image, a cult of his own magnetic personality that was passionately preached by a band of loyal, trusted followers. A den of murderers and thieves indoctrinated to believe if they follow Dutch's will, a will that involved robbery, murder, and a creed twisted so deeply they can never hope to be able to identify they were the very things they claim not to be, outlaws and enemies of the state, similar to Dutch's own rival, Colm O'Driscoll. Yet very different. Colm and his men kill for the pleasure of just being a mindless degenerate. Dutch and his band of followers fight to live free, killing and robbing only those who can afford it, offering the plunder to those less fortunate. To these talented gunslingers, they were never fighting for the sake of fighting, but rather they were fighting for a world that is quickly fading away, a world that is slowly suffocating them. From their perspective, what they were, what they were fighting for, and the man who led them all became romanticized. Dutch was seen as a modern-day Robin Hood, a figure of mythic proportion, the only one who can still lead lost souls to safety. He's a man with a plan. And today we're going to be taking a look into the mind and personality that is Dutch Vanderlyn. Trusted, adopted father, kind-hearted leader, selfish and vengeful killer. Many place the blame of his unraveling mind and constantly loosening grip of reality on Micah, a yes-man who cared for little outside of satisfying his own need to survive. Micah time and again displays a lack of consideration towards the outcome of his actions, especially if it comes at the cost of the gang's well-being. And he's often the scapegoat. He's only been riding with the gang for a short period of time at the onset of Red Dead Redemption 2's story after all, and many cite him as a factor in the Dutch that we get at the end of the game. A man dedicated to making as much quote-unquote noise as possible, in an effort to successfully pull off one final grand robbery, and then escapes the virgin lands he has talked so highly of throughout the game. Others cite the death of Hosea. Besides Dutch himself, Hosea is the oldest member in the gang, followed only by Arthur. It's with Micah chipping away at Dutch's conscience, Hosea being publicly executed, all compounded by the symptoms of an untreated head injury, people claim it's not a singular cause of why Dutch is very different at the end of the game but rather specific critical blows that he would never be able to really recover from. However, I don't even think that's entirely true, as we'll see. I don't think Mike is entirely to blame. The only blame I believe Micah can receive is catering to the madness that always lies just below Dutch's surface. All Dutch ever needed was assurance and validation that his way of living, his creed, his will, and what he saw fit was true. And there's nothing wrong with taking what's yours in a world so unjust. I don't think Dutch's head injury really plays that much of a significant role in his decline 
Ryan either. If there was any one thing, it would be the absence of Hosea's rationale, something that's so desperately needed during the chapter of Beaver Hollow, but even with Hosea gone, that would not explain the senseless or outright willingness to kill people in cold blood. The ultimate betrayal of his own law on those that follow him. The law that is meant to separate himself and his group from the rest of the outlaws that roam the lands of the West. While there are many debates and points of view on when, how, or why Dutch fell into the perceived madness he descended into at the end of Red Dead Redemption 2, and it is an undoubtedly drastically different Dutch. One, that outright kills Leviticus Cornwall in broad daylight under a heavy security and armed presence in the town of Annisburg after offering him a deal that he knew Cornwall would never even consider, let alone take. Dutch then launches assaults in the US military either directly or indirectly involved. He lights a fire in the belly of eagle flies and all the younger natives encouraging them to push and fight back against the US military by any means necessary. And then Dutch even decides to hit a train with gold mints for the United States military on top of blowing bridges. There's no doubt these are all actions he most likely would never give a second thought at the beginning of the game. Whether if we want to attribute that to the Council of Hosea, the overall state of the Vanderlyn gang and the fact the members collectively didn't have to deal with the tragedy and hardship after hardship as they had to deal with as the game progressed. They had no choice but to endure the deaths of Hosea, Lenny, Sean, losing gold, being made fools of by Angelo Bronte, which in turn led to depleted morale, added outside pressure, and with it increasing question and curiosity with what the hell is truly going on. I don't doubt the events of the game impact the Dutch's psyche. I don't doubt every unfortunate event resulted in some sort of doubt, some sort of question in Dutch's leadership, in Dutch's planning, in Dutch's priorities. Was it really him or the rest of the gang he was looking after? Had things changed or was this always the case? Dutch Vanderlyn Finishing School has some strange graduates. That it does. To your good health. Thank you. For when to get a quick glimpse of Dutch's true character, you don't need to look any further than the first two chapters of the game. While not yet blatantly in your face, Dutch has already shown indirectly the character that lies just beneath the surface. In the opening mission alone, we get to see the charismatic leader he is and the flair for public speaking that he has. We are going to ride out and we are going to find some food. Everybody, we're safe now. There ain't nobody following us through a storm like this one. And by the time they get here, well, we're going to be, we're going to be long gone. We've been through worse than this before. Now all of you, all of you, get yourselves warm. Stay strong. Stay with me. We ain't done yet. An ability to rally the people, his people, behind him. To have the utmost faith and trust in him. For he, now more than ever before, needs all of them. And none of them can hope to survive without trusting and relying on each other. The gang is on the run deep into the mountains, facing a terrible blizzard head on, desperate to escape the law that's hot on their trail. Dutch being the head of the group should take blame for the unfortunate position they all find themselves in. Besides damn near freezing to death, the gang has suffered some casualties as well, resulting in a few people killed and at least two to three people missing, if we were to count John. That's also not taken into account that Dutch committed a senseless killing in the heat of a robbery. A robbery which Arthur and Hosea didn't feel too confident in, betting their money on a real estate scam. Nonetheless, beginning with the events of Blackwater, as many of us know, and as we heard from Javier Escuela during this video's introduction, Dutch killed an innocent girl during the ferry boat robbery back in Blackwater, and according to Javier's description, she was killed in a quote-unquote bad way. So, you were there, Javier. What really happened on that boat? We had the money, it seemed fine. And suddenly they were everywhere. Bounty hunters? No, Pinkertons. It was crazy. Raining bullets. Dutch killed a girl in a bad way. But it was a bad situation. That ain't like him, though. Javier then continues to dismiss the severity of Dutch's decision to take this poor girl's life by stating it was a quote-unquote bad situation. I always found that statement interesting. 
because it comes off as Javier attempting to rationalize Dutch's actions, diminishing the transgression of Dutch killing this poor innocent girl. And on top of it, the gruesome details later recounted by people who had experienced the execution such as John, who during the chapter of Shady Bell, has some in-game dialogue opening up about how he quote unquote can't get the image of her death out of his head, and he's starting to doubt Dutch's leadership. But really, it's the account from the strange man in Red Dead Redemption that gives us the best details pertaining to her death. Do you remember Hattie McCourt's face? Who? She was a girl Dutch Vanderlyn shot in the head on that raid on the ferry a few years back. Same one you got shot on. Pretty girl, until her eye was hanging out by a thread of tendon and her brain was plastered over a wall. This interaction gives us a name, Heidi McCourt, and it gives us the details of the brutality surrounding her death at the hands of Dutch. Frankly, it's no wonder John was traumatized and Javier described it as a bad way. Even Dutch had to acknowledge it was horrible to himself or that he fucked up spectacularly because when directly confronted by Arthur about what exactly happened, Dutch just responds with, Hey, I ain't had time to ask you. What really went down back there on that boat? We missed you. That's what happened. Come on. Obviously, hindsight is 2020, and we don't know it yet, but the pattern for Dutch's behavior, that is later identified as reckless, is already starting to take shape. Dutch has killed someone. Members loyal to him question the action, but don't start to challenge him, what he's doing, or even question the state of mind he's in. Certain things change with this event, because it's mainly attributed to the maniac that is Micah, who's been nothing but trouble for the gang since his recruitment. Blackwater's almost entirely blamed on him, but even Micah didn't have that much control over Dutch. That's the point of having Dutch willingly break his own creed, his own rule of killing folk in cold blood. It's evident through Dutch's utter contempt towards the civilized world's growing power and with it the increased support for universal law, that he has an issue with following orders or submitting to another person's will. Many people have already established time and again Dutch is a severe narcissist. He thinks so highly of himself and his mission that men such as Cornwall, Bronte, and Milton deserve nothing short of death for condemning a man of such high stature for the people as he is. What is not really emphasized as much is how his refusal to submit to others doesn't apply exclusively to those outside of his own ranks. Dutch is often discussing with Hosea why he is right and why Hosea should side with him. We don't need to take revenge. We hardly know the guy. This ain't about revenge, Hosea. Angelo Bronte don't mean shit to me. This is about the fact we are planning to rob a bank in his town. A bank that he no doubt protects. A town where his men are gunning for us. Jose is the only person ever allowed to rationalize with Dutch. Even Arthur in the later events of the game can't get through to him. He's someone who once his mind is made up, nothing's going to change it. You're either with him or against him. Micah chose to side with him. However, going along with someone can't be mistaken for convincing or pushing someone into doing something that's contradictory to their own morals, values, or ways of behaving. And if we were to go a little bit further and take a look at Arthur's journal, we can see what was going on with Dutch and everyone around him after the trolley station job, a particular situation that's often cited as one of the main breaking points for Dutch, with him always ranting and raving at how Bronte tricked and betrayed him, playing him and the gang for a fool. Dutch was so unnerved and upset about it that no one even thought of entertaining the idea of sparing Bronte or even mentioning Bronte at all to Dutch. Not even Micah. Arthur outright directly says in his journal, Dutch is raging about Bronte's deception or betrayal or whatever quite it was. Dutch don't like being made a fool of. Even Micah with all his teasing and nettling plays it real cool with Dutch. This, I believe, further supports what I was saying about Dutch refusing to submit to another's will. Micah was nothing more than a yes-man and a scapegoat for the gang's woes. Woes that ultimately was attributed to Dutch's own poor decision-making. That, in turn, was falsely placed on Micah, who was well aware he could not force Dutch into doing or acting any more than Hosea could. By Arthur mentioning that Micah was unwilling to even approach Dutch about the topic of Bronte shows just who was really in control there between Dutch and Micah. I just wanted to point that out because I feel Micah's role in Dutch's decline is always mistaken. I'm not arguing Micah definitely didn't help and encourage Dutch to make all the wrong choices. However, by placing the blame on Micah and saying that he is the cause of all of it couldn't be further from the truth. Dutch was always primed, ready, and willing to take lives. At the end of the day, after all, he is an outlaw. And as many of the members have said before, how do you rob and kill others pleasantly? Despite Dutch's talk, they don't. It doesn't take much to cross the threshold from looking at someone as an obstacle in the gang's path that should be and will be eliminated no matter what. 
even if that meant taking their life. Looking at someone that without a doubt is standing in their way, such as the Pinkertons or the Adriscolls or even Bronte, to then turn the aggression onto civilians and justify it as something that needed to happen in order for the gang to survive is exactly what Dutch ended up doing. What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. You keep killing folk, Dutch. I am just trying to make sure that some of us survive, Arthur. It took time for him to finally address the murder of Heidi McCourt, but when he did, he says it was necessary for the gang's survival. The same sentiment he echoed when confronted by someone with what is going on or with what Dutch is doing. Dutch, time and again, attempts to rationalize his actions by stating it's necessary for the gang's survival. I don't know. Well, I do. It ain't nice. I know it. But it is us or him. I figure it might as well be him. He uses the same excuse with Heidi's death. He does the same thing with the brutal drowning of Angelo Bronte and the latest shooting of Leviticus Cornwall. These are all people that will not let the gang survive or leave them be. So long as they draw breath, they are a threat and need to be eliminated, or so Dutch claims. Arguably due to his own power and immense resources, Leviticus Cornwall was the only person who could touch Dutch and the rest of the gang no matter where they went. Bronte, on the other hand, while he may have posed an immediate threat so long as the gang stayed close to or, or continued to run operations within the city of Saint-Denis, yes, Bronte would be a threat. Would he be such a threat as to really make his death necessary before the robbery of the Saint-Denis bank? Ultimately, I think the bank of Saint-Denis could have been hit even if Bronte was allowed to live. It may have taken some additional planning or even required time to be sacrificed in order for it to all work out, but it could still have been managed. Bronson himself was a very arrogant man and considered Dutch a dirty hillbilly, surprised at his own ability to just clothe himself. Dutch played dumb and even submitted to Bronte once before in his mansion upon the first time they met. We are simple country folk. All we have is each other. And you have gone and you have took his son and that which we weren't innocent of, well, we, we most surely were ignorant of. Dutch could have definitely feigned ignorance or found some way to play into Bronte's sense of superiority, letting the man to live, avoiding killing him, and even making a bad situation a whole lot worse. However, he let his emotions get the best of him. Giving in so passionately to his emotions, he made no reservations about insulting and even taunting Bronte while he brutally drowned him. Going so far as finishing Bronte's killing by humiliating him even further, by eliminating his very existence of ever living on this planet and feeding him to alligators. This brutal demonstration of Dutch's high ego and perception of himself, leaving nothing left of the man whose biggest mistake was playing Dutch for an idiot. Dutch, I would argue, has always allowed his emotions to really dictate his or rather the gang's next course of action to some degree. Bronte's death is undeniably unique given the brutality and lack of control Dutch is usually seen to have. This is the only time he has ever committed something so heinously by his own hands and the intensity of which is unprecedented. And it far betrays his original claim of Bronte's death being a necessary step in order for the bank robbery of San Denis to ever hope to be a success. Whether if that statement was really true or not, what is undeniable is Dutch's own hatred towards this man. This was a murder that had a strong personal element to it. And when that element was scrutinized, Dutch implied the person questioning his decision was a traitor, as seen during the drowning of Bronte and the strangulation of the old lady's death on Guerma. The question here I want to present to all of you is, is the Vanderland gang all about being for the people, or do the people under his leadership represent the entity that is Dutch Vanderland? Start dancing? Looks like I turned into the goddamn air boy. You have turned into my son. You worry because I worry. We are just the same. Horseshoe Overlook introduces the gang's ledger, a feature of the game that allows the player to reinvest into the camp and to a degree, its members. If we were to look at this as a key factor of the game's lore and not just an extra thing to invest your time and resources in from strictly gameplay perspective, then it provides some extra insight into Dutch's mentality and the culture within the gang's hierarchy. Dutch immediately after escaping the freezing cold of the mountains can be seen often lounging around the camp, smoking a cigar, donning on extravagant clothing, and even occasionally breaking out into an impromptu speech on how he and the rest of the gang need each other. 
motivating them to work harder. Besides his clothes and really not doing much, Detch has the biggest and most private living space, complete with his own phonograph or gramophone, and his tent is one of the earliest upgrades you can invest in within the ledger. On the one hand, his lack of being hands-on is excusable. After all, it seems most members already have the, I trust Dutch and if I can do it, why leave it up to him to do the heavier lifting mentality? I'll do the hard work and he'll see us through. Regardless of what his plan is, we'll all be okay. This mindset proved highly beneficial for Dutch. It prevented him from descending to the level of others, sparing him the need to engage in unsavory tasks as those around him were much more willing to handle such matters on his behalf. This solidified his standing as a figure akin to a deity, a man set apart from the rest. Even when he did make a mistake, as he did back in Blackwater, it was much more palatable for others to believe that Dutch didn't intentionally make the decision himself. Instead, they found it easier and much more reassuring to think of him seeking counsel and acting on behalf of another, in Blackwater's case that being Micah, because acknowledging the mistake that it was actually of Dutch's design fractured the idolized image of him, and along with it the unwavering faith they all had in him and his overall message. Better to find flaws in other humans rather than this mythic Robin Hood. Regarded as a morally upright individual in a world lacking such virtue, Dutch managed to keep his hands clean of any unsavory tasks. This in turn allowed him to skillfully manipulate that same exact perception, gradually convincing everyone that he prioritized their well-being above all else. However, Hosea consistently urged consideration for the gang's overall situation, cautioning that certain actions could lead to more harm and fatalities. As seen in the initial train heist targeting Leviticus Cornwall as it departed the Grizzly Mountains and later again during Dutch's deliberation on preparing for an assault on Angela Bronte's mansion. I just don't want any more folks to die, Dutch. We're living, Hosea, we're living. Look at me. We're living. Even you. But we need money. Everything we have is in Blackwater. You fancy heading back there? No. Listen, Dutch, I ain't trying to undermine you. I just... Dutch, however, responded to these expressions of concern by framing them as doubts in him. From his earliest culture, any form of opposition, even innocent inquiries about what comes next, was construed as doubting his leadership. This perception shift might have been a consequence of time naturally progressing, leading to a belief that he embodied the gang itself, something that's not all too uncommon when someone is constantly within their own head trying to justify their own at least train of thoughts, let alone the consequences that lead to succumbing to those thoughts, but his caprices and even decisions were increasingly viewed as made for the collective good of the gang, even when that wasn't entirely true. The full extent of the truth in this matter may remain elusive, as Dutch's occasional attempts to align with Hosea imply a recognition that he sometimes knew he acted based on his own personal desires rather than the gang's collective best interests. The evolution of this perception into Dutch's reality during Hoshu Overlook is debatable. However, as the game advances, there's an indication of it gaining strength. This is evident during a casual fishing retreat with Jose and Arthur, where Dutch initially admits he believes he will be okay, only to then hastily correct himself by saying, we. I think, I, well, I mean, we, are gonna be okay. One can interpret this lapse in two distinct ways. One perspective is that Dutch is very selfish, solely concerned with just his well-being, viewing the gang members merely as tools to fulfill his desires. From this viewpoint, they become expendable pawns, kept compliant by their unwavering belief in Dutch's vision and his perceived capability to turn it into reality, regardless of its apparent impossibility. On the flip side, the alternative perspective is that Dutch embodies the entirety of the gang, mind, body, and spirit. According to this viewpoint, it's his responsibility to guide them all to the untarnished territories of the West, a commitment he fervently made to each member. However, driven by his own narcissism, Dutch assumes the role of the glorified outlaw, a messiah for the lost souls. This entails donning specific attire, dwelling in a tent, more glorious than a rest, and adopting a manner of speech that befits only a savior. Even if Dutch's role as a savior was more theoretical than truthful, delving into the realm of emotions, no one manipulates them quite like Dutch, and among those impacting the most is Arthur. While this dynamic isn't unique to just Arthur, he stands as his primary victim. It happens time and again, but I think one of the more blatant in-your-face instances is if we go back to Coulter within the first 20 minutes of the game, when Arthur gets his chance to ask Dutch what exactly happened on the ferry boat in Blackwater, Dutch's response is simply, we missed you. 
On the surface, it's easy to just dismiss this as Dutch believing that an extra gunman, someone as efficient as Arthur, definitely would have been extremely helpful and went a long way. However, I think there's more to that statement, especially within Arthur, where there's a strong father-son bond here. It's meant to evoke a profound sense of regret. It plants the seed of thought within Arthur of, if I had been there, Perhaps this chaos could have been averted. Maybe I could have intervened to prevent things from spiraling out of control or even saved a life or two. The question of whether Dutch truly sees himself as the gang becomes more intricate as the game progresses, especially when you consider how he manipulates motions time and again. Gratitude appears to be the pivotal motion tethering everyone to Dutch. After all, he did rescue them from the perils of abandonment, preventing them from being left to fend for themselves or in some instances, faring even worse with other gangs. To renounce this faith in Dutch is akin to rejecting the man who saved them. As mentioned earlier in this discussion, Dutch isn't inherently a villain. At one point, he might have been an upright individual embodying the principles he preached. However, in the moments leading up to, during, and following the events of Red Dead Redemption 2, he proves not to be the man we initially believed him to be. And it becomes an overall complex situation. A situation where in this video, we just look at how the mask slipped. And it continued to slip between Dutch's fingers after every single critical blow. From the death of Hosea, money being lost, pressures from multiple threats all around him. And then him continually taking things much, much more personally. Using the gang and its members as a vessel to achieve the thing that he said the gang never needed to achieve. And that being revenge. We are all bastards, my friend. But only one of us is some would-be emperor's whore. We know who you are. And nobody knows who you are. Not even your goddamn father. You maggots.